looks like you came up with the right mechanism and products there. That's good. Who's our nucleophilic atom now? Well, more nucleophilic than this water is this negative charge on the sulfur. So we should use the negative charge on the sulfur. Again, we have to pay attention to the charges. Those are the reactive atoms. We already know this is an electrophilic carbon with a delta positive, And we can use this as a leaving group because of the ring strength. I think originally you might have forgotten to put in this error, but then you went back and put that in to show that this is a leaving group. Here we show the sulfur having attacked. And then to get rid of the charge, nature wants to deprotonate the water. I think you might let, let, have left out the head on this arrow over here. So we need to show the electrons moving. All these little, little details can make a difference. Here's another one little detail. It's not conventional to draw the sulfur group like this. We have to show the sulfur bonded to the carbon and the hydrogen on the other side. Like this. The main product that we're interested in is this. Here we have an alcohol group on one side. And here we have an SH group. By the way, the name for this is a thiol. I don't know if you guys need to know that name. But even, whether you know the name or not, it's important to be able to draw the right product. The key thing is, again, we found a way to get functional groups on adjacent carbons. Attacking epoxides is a good way to get functional groups on adjacent carbons. Usually, one of the functional groups ends up being an alcohol, because that comes from the epoxide oxygen after it protonates. But the other functional group could be many different things, depending on what nucleophile you use. Depending on what nucleophile you use, you can get many different functional groups on the other carbon. You could just as well have had the sulfur attacking the number two carbon here. This is symmetric, so it doesn't matter whether you show it attacking the number one or the number two. There was no stereochemistry here again, because these were not stereocenters. There's no way in organic chemistry that we can show every possible reaction. What we're trying to do here is learn the patterns so that we can apply those. This fell into the same pattern as before. Some other patterns that we might see. There's many other nucleophiles that could attack here. Another nucleophile that your instructor mentioned in the notes here was you might use these reagents. Well, who would be the nucleophilic atom here? this oxygen here, and then it would be, again, a very similar reaction. Okay. To save time, we won't go through that. Or you could use cyanide. Who's the nucleophilic atom in cyanide? The carbon, not the nitrogen. We need to memorize that in cyanide, it's the carbon and not the nitrogen that's the nucleophile. And again, you should be able to work out on your own then what product we would get from that. Let's say that somebody has a negative charge. Well, that tends to make them electrophilic or nucleophilic? nucleophilic? Nucleophilic. However, unfortunately, it's more complicated than that. Earlier, we were seeing that positive charges sometimes make an atom electrophilic, but sometimes they make the adjacent atom electrophilic. Well, it's the same idea for negative charges. Sometimes a negative charge, actually, you and I talked about that yesterday. Well, sometimes a negative charge makes an atom nucleophilic, but sometimes it makes the adjacent atom nucleophilic. So how can you tell which situation you're in? Why don't, we, why don't we take a look at the reactivity handout again from yesterday? Do you have that reactivity handout with you? It's the handout on the effect of charges. Thank you. So yesterday we were seeing that if an atom has a positive charge and incomplete octet, then it's an electrophile. But if an atom has a positive charge in a complete octet, it's actually the adjacent atom that's the electrophile. Well, now we're going to focus on the nucleophiles. Yeah, let's take that out. That's the one. Let's uh, take that out. So according to that handout, the important difference is whether you've got a lone pair or not.
If an atom has a negative charge and a lone pair, then it's a nucleophile. But if an atom has a negative charge and no lone pair, then it's the adjacent atom that's the nucleophile. So in this case, it's the Y atom that would be the nucleophile. These are simply rules that we need to memorize. And where is the Y atom going to get the, the electrons to donate from the bond? This oftentimes messes people up because if an atom has a lone pair, usually it would use the lone pair to be a nucleophile. But in this case, this Y atom is going to use the electrons in the bond uh, to donate as a nucleophile. So just as a positive charge sometimes makes an atom electrophilic and sometimes makes the adjacent atom electrophilic, a negative charge sometimes makes an atom nucleophilic and sometimes makes the adjacent atom nucleophilic. It depends on whether the atom with the char negative charge has a lone pair or not. If you've got a lone pair and a negative charge, you're a nucleophile. But if you, have a lone, if you have a negative charge and no lone pair, it's the adjacent atom that's the nucleophile, and the adjacent atom will use the bond as its source of electrons. So I think that's here in the reactivity handout in the first two rows. Yeah. So let's see what our product would be with these reagents. We'll go through this together. This is an important reaction. You probably get, have you guys ever done any work with lithium aluminum hydride yet? Okay, it sounds like it hasn't come up much. This is important on your, will be important on your next test, and it's going to be even more important after this next test. This is an important rea uh, reagent to be comfortable with. Let me show you what the structure of lithium aluminum hydride looks like. We need to memorize the structure of lithium aluminum hydride. This is the structure of lithium aluminum hydride. We just need to memorize that. Just like earlier, we memorized the structure of sulfuric acid. We need to memorize this structure, because this is going to be an important reagent for the whole rest of the course, the rest of this term and the upcoming terms as well. For the rest of the course, we're going to be using lithium aluminum hydride a lot. Mm -hmm. Notice that there's a negative charge on this aluminum. Now, the lithium here is just a spectator ion. It's not going to be participating. It's like the sodium and potassium spectator ions that we've used a lot in the past. So we're not going to do anything with the lithium except use it as a counter ion. Mm -hmm. It's just countering this negative charge on the aluminum. Now, going back to the epoxide, where is the electrophilic atom in the epoxide? It's the um, carbon. Because it's got a delta positive. So this is going to go at the head of an arrow. Now we have to find the nucleophile. Well, who is the nucleophilic atom in lithium aluminum hydride? Hydrogen. Why the hydrogen and not the aluminum? Because it uh, has no lone pairs. Yeah, actually, I didn't tell you that. But if you, if you worked it out from the periodic table, you would see that this aluminum has no lone pairs. This aluminum has no lone pairs. The aluminum is just from the third column. So it's already used up all of its possible electrons and bonds here. Notice the aluminum already has four bonds, so where would it have any lone pairs? Even just by looking at this, we can kind of see the aluminum has no lone pairs, because then it would be breaking the octet rule. It's already got four bonds, so clearly it has no lone pairs. Well, that's why we went over this material over here. If you have a negative charge and a lone pair, that makes you a nucleophile. But if you have a negative charge and no lone pair, it's the adjacent atom that's the nucleophile. So in this case, this is not a source of nucleophilic aluminum. It's a source of nucleophilic hydrogen. The important thing about lithium aluminum hydride is that it's a source of nucleophilic hydrogen. That's the key thing that we need to know. It's a source of nucleophilic hydrogen. I don't think you guys have ever seen, up till now, a source of nucleophilic hydrogen. So this is our first source of nucleophilic hydrogen. Now where is the hydrogen going to get the electrons from that it's going to donate? It's going to take it from the bond. That's right. So I need to put the tail of the arrow on the bond. This is, again, different than you've seen before, because all the nucleophiles you've used up to this point, I believe, had lone pairs. I believe all the nucleophiles you've used up to the point, this point had lone pairs, so you could just put the, the, the tail of the arrow on the lone pair, or on the negative charge. But in this case, obviously, hydrogen doesn't have any lone pairs. It has to get the electrons from the bond. I'll draw in the electrons that it's taking. So it would be wrong to put the tail of the arrow on the hydrogen. 
you can't put the tail on the hydrogen, and it would be wrong to draw a lone pair on the hydrogen. You have to put the, the tail over here. And we can't forget that since this electrophilic carbon has a full octet, the only way it can be attacked by a nucleophile is if the leaving group leaves. So again, we have to break this bond and treat this oxygen like a leaving group. Well, these are the arrows then that show the, the, the reaction of the lithium aluminum hydride with the epoxide. 